anxious to preach this message for many weeks now. Feels like months. Uh, kind of going over it yesterday again to refresh my mind on it. And um, it's pretty precious. I just bless the Lord for it. Thank God for the message. And uh, the title is I Will Save Thy Children. The mindset is um, that, that you need to be in is that even if you don't have children yet, uh, they're in your body right now. And uh, you have an eternal soul, and the children that are in you have eternal souls. And you need to be sober of that. <clears throat> and as, as we get persecuted in our, in our life, as believers are persecuted, you need to realize that your persecution, how you reply to that persecution, isn't just for your own sake. It's for your children's sake also. Uh, there was a time when, you, don't, you know the story well, when the children of Israel were leaving uh, Egypt, and uh, in all that condition, they were, they were trapped by the sea, and they were going to be slaughtered by the largest army in the world, with all the forces and fierceness coming right at them. And, of course, the children of Israel feared. And Moses, Moses said, uh, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. The Lord shall fight for you. In the day of your adversity in this life, in the day of temptation, the day of trial, in the day of torment, in your life, realize that your children are right there with you in this. Whether you're a dad or a mom now or not, doesn't even isn't even the point. Your children are with you, and you need to react based on God's word, not your own heart. React based on God's word. Fight off your enemies is not with your own body or your own means. It's God fights off your enemies. And of course, when the children of Israel were fleeing, and they, they, God slaughtered every one of them. Every one of the enemies, God slaughtered for the children of Israel to save the children of Israel from their enemies. And he will slaughter your enemies, is the point of this message. He will slaughter them. Isaiah 49, let me read Isaiah 49, verse 22. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons and they shall bring thy sons in their arms and their daughters on their shoulders. And the king shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of their feet, of thy feet. And that they and thou shall know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me, is what God tells you this morning. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children, and will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. And they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. God Almighty is known in this last point that I want to make here with the reading of the Scripture. The mighty God, the mighty one of Jacob, God is known in his people. Our God is the God of his elect. Jacob is the elect of God Almighty. Every one of us are in God and we're in God and, and he's in us. But this God protects his people. When we're being attacked by the enemy, he feeds the flesh of our enemies to them. What a mighty God. This message is a practical application of the gospel. <clears throat> Grace is unearned favor. Each one of us that are safe in Christ have received this salvation by grace. Nothing we did to deserve it or earn it. All by grace are you saved. And that unearned favor has to be reflected in your life. It has to be shown out in your life. And the time to show it the best time is when the enemy is face to face with you. When your enemy is attacking you, <clears throat> this is the time to show the gospel and to show grace. <clears throat> we have to be strong in the word. We have to act by grace according to God's word, not our own heart. 
the, the word says the, the person that follows their own heart, they're a fool. And a fool is defined as a person that says there's no such thing as God. We're not fools. We're not godless. We have the true God. And when we're faced with our enemy, combating us, tormenting us, tricking us, that is when we should grow up and live by grace. <clears throat> the introduction is, is right here on the same page, probably. It's on Isaiah 50, chapter 50, verse 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? Are you resting on Christ's righteousness alone for your salvation? Then this is talking about you. But that walk in darkness and hath not light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord that, and stay upon his God. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in light of your fire, and in the sparks of that ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. God's teaching out of Isaiah 50, verses 10 through 11, by way of introduction, that if you go on the sparks of your own counsel, you go on your own understanding, especially in times of temptation, especially when your enemy is facing you and tormenting you, you're going to lie down in sorrow. You won't lose your soul unto hell. That's impossible. But you're going to be sorrowful in that torture in this life. You're going to be sorrowful in it. You're going to go on your own understanding? That's, that's ridiculous. Do not go on your own understanding. Don't look away from the gospel. Don't look away from the word when your enemy is face to face with you and they want to kill you and they want to torment you. Keep your sons and your daughters in your arms. Look, look at our text here in Isaiah 49. <clears throat> Not a hard time reading it. It's at the end of verse 22. Bring thy, son, thy sons in thy arms, and thy daughters will be carried upon your shoulders. You have got sons in your arms. Whether you have one son now, or you're going to have ten sons, they're all in your arms. And your daughters, they're all up here in the safest spot, the highest spot. They're all right on you and right about you and around you. And you have to be sober to that when you're being attacked. This isn't for your future. It's for your children's 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 future when you're being attacked. And by God's grace, you have to have your eyes on Christ in that attack. And it's on the scriptures. The second Timothy three sixteen says, All scriptures given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There it is. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When you're tormented in this lifetime by your enemies, that's the time for good works. That's the time to have your eyes on Christ. <clears throat> Good works are an outcome of salvation. They're not an input. My word, why would you ever think your works could attain salvation for you? That's foolishness. Good works are exactly what we go to and resort to when our eyes are on Christ and we're being tormented in this lifetime. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God are in Him, are yea and amen, unto the glory of God by us. We bring glory to God. Honor to God in the times of temptation and trials and torments of our enemies. Especially against our enemies, we glorify God when they torment us. That's what this message is about. Glorifying God when the enemy torments you. When they're attacking you. When they're in the front of your face, teasing you and tricking you. He says, cast away not your confidence in Hebrew 10. Don't cast away your confidence which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have the need of patience. Patience is turning those hardships and losses into worship towards God. And that's what it needs to be. You need to worship towards God when your enemy attacks you. That after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive a promise. <laughs> Resting on God's word alone is the means by which you can go through any tormenting thing in your lifetime. Everything that's a torment in this life, you can sail straight through it if your eyes are on Christ. In the Word, God's Word alone is how you make decisions in your life and how you go through the storm and go through the torments and when you're being attacked. 
When you're attacked, point number one, from the enemy, this is a promise to believers. It's in Isaiah 49, the first verse I read, 22. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. Right away, he's saying, the people that I set my standard up to, the ones that I preach the gospel, my son to, these are the ones that are going to go through this tormenting time in their life. We're going to be attacked by our enemies. Look at verse 23. The king shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens and thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth. These are your enemies that are going to bow down to you. These enemies that are attacking you are eventually going to bow down to you. They're going to lick up the dust of your feet. That thou shalt know that I am the Lord. For they, for thy, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. You have to wait on God for direction during the tempestuous storm of your life. During the trial and the hardship and when the enemy is coming fiercely towards you. You have to wait on God and stand strong and wait for him. Look at verse 25. But thus saith the Lord God, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered, for I will contend with him that contendeth with thee. God promises it. He's, you got people contending against you, pushing you, being mean to you, being wicked against you, attacking you. God says, that's my work. That's my business to contend with them. You don't have to do a thing. Don't worry about it. Don't press yourself on it. Look to God Almighty in it, and he'll deliver you. And he's going to save your children in it. <clears throat> this is the battle. It's God's. The battle is God's alone. So if you visualize yourself standing there in the battle, and your sons are in your arms, and your daughters are on your shoulders, and you're being attacked by the world for believing the gospel, for not celebrating Christmas, you're going to be attacked for not celebrating a heathen holiday. What a disgrace that we're attacked by that. But we are. You're going to be attacked for, for not following your heart. You're going to be attacked for knowing that God alone has free will and you don't ascribe righteousness to yourself whatsoever. You're going to be attacked for these things. Look to the standard, point number two. Look to the standard during that time. Verse 22, it says it. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. You know what the standard is in Hebrew? A beacon. He's going to raise up a beacon. That's a light. A beacon and a light to the people to see Christ is your way out of that temptation and torment. Christ is the one to look to. He's the only Son of God the Father. He died on the cross for a particular people. He was buried in the earth, and he raised the third day. In all your trials, all your temptations, and all your fears, and when your enemy is attacking, look to the standard. All those problems fade away when you're looking to Christ. In Luke 23, he says, Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Father, under thy hands I commend my spirit. Christ gave up the ghost. Nobody took Christ's life from him. He laid it down of his own on the cross of Calvary for a particular people. And he bought our pardon with his blood when he laid down his life. Then he was buried in the earth. Look at, look at Mark 15 with me. Turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse 37. This is where Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Now, anybody that died on the cross, that was a, a death that was of suffocation. And Christ, when he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, that was an open declaration that he laid down his life on the cross of Calvary. Nobody took it from him. He laid it down. He gave up the ghost by his own will for his father, to his father. And the veil of the temple, it was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he had so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. 
And that centurion's right. Christ is the only Son of God the Father, the one that can save sinners from their sin. There were also women looking at afar off, verse 42. And now, <clears throat> when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, he came and went boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled if he had already died. It was only a few hours on the cross. It takes a lot longer for people to suffocate on the cross. He called to him the centurion, and Pilate asked whether that's, if he was really dead for a while. And when Pilate knew of the centurion, then he gave the body to Joseph. And he brought fine linen. Joseph brought fine linen and took him down off the cross and wrapped him in linen and laid him in a sepulcher, which was hewn out of rock. And he rolled a stone under the door of the sepulcher. This is the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world that laid down his life on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago and was buried in this <coughs> earth in a rock for, for sinners, for God-haters, for people that need salvation. Christ was tormented in our place on the cross and then laid down in that grave, his dead body in that grave for three days and then he was resurrected. Why am I preaching Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. It's where your mind has to go when you're in the temptation and toil of the, of the battle. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If your mind's anywhere else, when your enemy attacks, you're going to get slaughtered and so will your children. And I don't want that for any of you. And I don't want it for your children and your children's children for 10 more, 20 more generations. However many generations there are from Grace Bible Church on, until the last day of this this earth. I want all of them saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, that wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. This passage says that the gospel is one issue. Well, there's a lot of doctrines predestiny, election, there's all kinds of precious doctrines. But the gospel, if the gospel be hid, its preachers stop preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. By God's grace, it's not going to be hid. The, the only time God saves is when you see that Christ died and was buried and was resurrected for you particularly. This has to be spoken. This has to be explained and declared because this is the power of God's salvation. He says in verse 2, by which also ye were saved. You weren't saved by election. You're saved by the blood of Christ. For I delivered it unto you, first of all, that which I also received. He said, I received the same thing. Anybody that's ever been saved received the same message and it is resting on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for them. Christ died for sins. Any sins? Every sin? No. The elect sins alone. Only the elect are covered with the blood of Christ. When Christ went to that cross, his mind was on one people, his bride. The very elect that God the Father put in Christ on that cross. He had us in his chest, right in his heart, in his mind, in his body, on that tree. All our sins, the sin that Adam committed and imputed to us, plus every one of your enacted sins. If you're ever to know Christ savingly, he knew every dastardly deed you would think, say, and do. It was right there on his body and in his body on the cross of Calvary. It had to be. It had to be paid for. All sin has to be dealt with. If you have one sin that you committed outside of Christ and the Christ didn't pay for it, you're perishing in that sin. You shall perish. It only takes one. 
but every one of the elect sins. That shows predestining. How can a person live a life that God doesn't know about? How can there be a baby born that God doesn't know about? How can there be any life unknown to God? God knows all, and all the elect were put into Christ on the cross of Calvary, and every sin that you shall commit in your lifetime was being paid for by Christ on the cross. All that torment that he endured for you was particularly because of you and your sin, because of your hate for God. Mm. We're in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. After that, he was seen 500 brethren, 500 brethren, saw him up out of the grave alive again. We have a lively Savior. It was good that he died. It was good that he was buried, but it's even better that he's resurrected because all his blood is good and declared righteous by God the Father when he was resurrected. It shows that Christ is the authentic Messiah. And he's the one to look to and rest on because he's alive. He's accepted. 500 brethren saw him at once, whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last he was seen of me. Was he a seen of you? Have you seen him resurrected yet? Have you seen your Lord and Savior that he actually did die, he was actually buried, and he was actually resurrected for you. Have you seen this yet? You need to. By God's grace, you need to. And this is where your eyes have to go when your enemies attack. There's no other doctrine that will help you. There's no other message that will help you. You have to go to the standard. Perfection, righteousness in Christ alone. This is the beacon that God the Father held up on the cross of Calvary and declares openly in his resurrection and in his ascension that he's the one to look to and rest on and rely on for salvation. This is the true Christ. He died for a particular people. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. <clears throat> and he took all the sins elect on himself. And now standing strong in heaven, you too are strong in heaven resurrected in Christ and your eyes on Christ and now you're being tormented in your lifetime with enemies all around you people attacking you for resting on this true Messiah and you're being attacked for it it's so illogical to a believer but it's necessary for you to be assured that you're safe in Christ and that your eyes truly are on him and that you're relying on your daughters on your shoulders and your sons in your arm to be saved by his blood and his righteousness alone your eyes have to be on Christ during this time in this fight. Don't ever look away from Christ. Don't ever yield to the world, to the world's doctrines, to the world's teachings. Trust your own heart. And don't ever set your children down. Don't take your, your children off your shoulders and off your arms and try to fight the battle with your own hands. That's a fool. Then what do you do? Your hands are busy. Your shoulders are bared down with weight. What do you do? You pray. You pray to God Almighty in this battle. The very ones that bring you harm are who you pray for. The very ones that hurt you, the very ones that make you angry, the very ones, the yes, those are the ones that you pray for. Anything less is casting your children off your shoulders and out of your arms and condemning them and walking away. You can't do that. You have to stand strong and pray for your enemies. Turn to Luke, Luke chapter 6. I told you this is a practical application of the gospel. Luke chapter 6 is where it's at. And this has been a theme the Lord's put on my heart for, for three years now. <clears throat> reflecting at the end of 2017 he put heavy on my heart that that this is the message for grace bible in this generation that our enemies we ought to be praying for them we ought to love them luke chapter 6 verse 26 woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you for so did their fathers that of well, the false prophets you're popular you're doomed everybody likes in your life you don't know God. You think you do, but you don't. But I say unto you, you which hear, 
I say unto you, you that hear of Christ, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. There it is. Anything less is casting your children off your shoulders and out of your arms and putting them in, in harm's way. When the enemy attacks you, hold strong to the gospel. Eyes on Christ, your mouth open in prayer for your enemy's benefit. For love of your enemy. Unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. Him that taketh away thy cloak, that's an inner garment, forbid him not to take the, thy coat, that's your outer coat. That's cold condition, isn't it? Go outside without a coat right now. You see what God's saying. Give it all away. Give it all away. These worldly pleasures, these worldly comforts, give them to your enemies. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, don't follow up with them. Give it forever. This is just junk in this life anyway. It's just a bunch of human stuff. And as ye would that men should do unto you, do ye also likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? Sinners, people that rest on their own self-righteousness, they love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also, they do the same. They want something in return. That's what sin is. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. They got to get back what they gave. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. If, if you know that you're unthankful and evil, this is where it becomes personal. God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. That's me. That's, that's all I am. That's what I contributed to my salvation. Unthankful and evil. What Jacob say when the world said, you ought to be proud of being an old man. <laughs> Few and evil have been my days. I'm nothing before God of myself. <clears throat> but ye therefore, be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. As your father. You know God savingly? You've tasted mercy. You've tasted unearned favor, grace. You've got a little flavor in your mouth that when you hated God, he loved you. While you were an enemy, 100% hell bent against God, he died for you then pray for your enemies. Why your enemy spitting in your face and hates you? Because that's what you did to God. When he loved you, you just hated him. And this is the practical application of Christianity. Praying for your enemy in the face of their hate for you. It's God's business to do what he wants with them. Whether that turns into salvation isn't your business. Whether that turns into eternal torment for your enemy, that's God's business. It's not yours. It's not yours to be even concerned about. Yours is to pray to God Almighty in that torment. <clears throat> Turn to Proverbs 25 next. Just two verses in Proverbs 25. Verse 21, they say this is in the Old Testament too. If you question this, loving your enemy and taking care of your enemy before yourself. Proverbs 25, verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So what God's saying is what God does with your enemy is God's business. Yours is to love your enemy. Yours is to take care of your enemy. Yours is to pour affection and resources and this world's pleasures upon your enemy. That's what we're to do to our enemies when they're attacking us. Anything less is dropping your children. Anything less is walking away from the gospel. Turn to Psalm 73, last, last passage this morning.
So we're to pray to God Almighty that he save our enemies, that he's kind to our enemies, that he's gentle to our enemies, just like he was towards us. While we yet hated him, he died for us and cared for us. And that's how we're to treat our enemies. Psalm 73 says, Truly God's good to Israel, that's the elect, even to such that are of a clean heart. That clean heart is to rest and rely on Christ's righteousness alone. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. They get what they want. Yeah, I don't, you don't get what you want as a believer, do you? You get what God gives you as a believer. The world, they're getting what they want. And they hate you because you're God Almighty's. They're corrupt and they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lofty. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of full cup are wrung out to them. God suffers persecution to, the, to his people. We have to be persecuted by the lost. And they say, how doth God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Well, the riches that they increase is when they persecute you and mock you and hate you. You give them prayer. You give them this world's riches out of your own pocketbook. You take care of your enemy. You love them. You love your enemy. This is God's will in your life. Anything less, turn back to our text in Isaiah. Verse 22, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'll lift up my hand to the Gentiles. I'll set up my standard to the people. That standard is Christ's righteousness on the cross of Calvary. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughter shall be carried upon their shoulders. In the time that you're tormented, in your lifetime, your sons and daughters are in your arms and on your shoulders. And those enemies that are attacking you have to be on your lips in prayer to God Almighty to take care of them and to care for them and love them back. Anything less is to drop your children and to walk away from your God. So the use of the message this morning <clears throat> is in Ezekiel 2, 5. It's right there at the bottom of your outline. Whether they hear or whether they forbear, that's God's business. That's God's business. Don't, don't get hung up on whether a person that attacks you comes to know God savingly or not. God will get revenge upon them His way or he'll save them. If he, if he chooses not to save them, it's going to be verse 26 for him. I will feed them with the I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. The very ones that oppress you in your lifetime that God won't save, even though you love that person back and pray for them, but God says, No, I'm not going to save them. Their very flesh is going to be chewed on by their own teeth throughout eternity. What are we? What what are we to be upset against our enemies when the wrath of God's going to bite upon them? What are we? Mm, may God sink this in and make it real in your life. That's my prayer for each one here.